Hey guys, Rex here. We're going to talk about the RX DMR courses coming up real soon. September 9th, I believe, is the first one we're going to do. It's out in Pennsylvania, and uh, we're super excited to meet you cats that are going to come out there. This is probably, I can't say this for sure, this might be the only time we offer this class on the commercial market. So uh, if you wanted to come and check us out, man, uh, come out to the Mifflin County Sportsman's Association there in uh, Pennsylvania, and uh, it'd, be, it'd be fun to hang out with you guys. Uh, a lot of people have been asking questions on rifle configurations and what is a you know designated marksman rifle, okay? To make the point and to simplify it, really it's the shooter with a rifle that's not broke that makes a designated marksman, okay? It's not, it's not equipment dependent, okay? There are configurations, of course, that are more conducive to that application. On the modern battlefield, there are certain ways that they have gone, like they have one 10 SR-25s, a lot of the new stuff that's coming out. You got a lot of stuff like, back in the old days, it was the M16A4, you know? And so like, that was a very straight, it's just like a 20 inch barrel configuration, throw a scope on there. And it's getting more and more sophisticated as time goes on. Um, however, huge emphasis on the shooter. It is a skill set, it is not an equipment set. So that's the big deal that I think folks maybe start off on the wrong foot on, is they assume that, you know, a designated marksman rifle is is more dependent on the equipment than the, than the skill set, okay? That's why I think that uh, it's very, very important to learn not only how to, you know, uh, execute combat marksmanship, which is quite a bit different than what you're gonna see in your comp competition world, and it's quite a bit different than what you're going to see, like what we did at the RX-1000, uh, the long-range precision shooting, the ELR shooting. Totally, totally different ball game in all reality. Combat marksmanship's exercising a whole different set of physical muscles and mental muscles. So you have to train that way to be able to operate that equipment in those conditions, okay? Also, there is a certain mindset and a discipline that is required to be effective in that skill set. Um, it's very, very, very hard to maintain your nerve to execute the fundamentals of marksmanship while excited, particularly in that particular role. So there's a huge emphasis on learning that as well. So not only do you have to be able to understand combat marksmanship, but you also got to have everything lined up in terms of not reinforcing unrealistic habits, like range habits that'll happen, um, you know, on like a normal range or, or in like a three gun match or in like, a, you know, the competitive world. It's a different skill set. I'm not saying it's harder or easier or better or worse. It's different. It's a totally different ball game. Okay, guys? Each one of these different deals is tailored for its own purpose, okay? When it comes to a designated marksman rifle, for those of you curious about equipment, we have a very comprehensive equipment list. If you go to rexdefense.com and look at the designated uh, marksman rifle courses, there's actually four courses that we have listed, okay? And we're gonna execute three of them, the first three in Pennsylvania here in September, okay? Starting on the 9th. And um, if you look at the equipment selection list, it's pretty comprehensive, okay? That's just kind of like, for someone who doesn't know at all, all the different things that a guy would need, it's, it's a very comprehensive list. But I don't want you to get bent out of shape on that deal. To keep it simple, you need a rifle that's reliable, rugged, configured in such a way that you will have logistical support for whenever that day comes, you might need to use it. Or, you know, if you're ever going to use it doing your job, wherever that might be. You know, there's a lot of guys that come to the training who are serious characters and have professions they put them in places where they don't have access to resupply or to where their resupply or or to where their logistics and their table of equipment will be radically different than other parts of the world right so if you're working in africa or asia certain parts it's actually in some cases better to run the local equipment just in terms of logistical flexibility right particularly in those uh scarier places of the world okay so that's one of the big considerations as well 
Um, the last consideration is really ergonomics, comfort, style, features, and stuff like that. So there's kind of an inverted view of what a designated rifle, marksman rifle should look like. Okay, um, Most people focus on the exact configuration, the little features, what kind of flip-up sights are you going to use, you know, what kind of grips, what kind of like stock are you going to have on there. I mean, you should always have furniture that suits you, but that's not the main priorities. So I'm a guy that likes to prioritize things. So the number one, hugest, biggest priority when it comes to the judicious selection of fighting equipment, uh, uh, our compadre Chase, who helped us, uh, helped us put this course together on one side of things. He's done a lot of the armory side of things, so he understands how to make weapons very reliable, okay? And um, he wrote an article for uh, rexreviews.org, and it's a very, very, very comprehensive, well-thought-out article. I'll put a link in the bottom of the video to it. You guys should read it. It's, uh, I think it's called the judicious selection of fighting equipment, okay? I'm gonna cover it in a very straightforward, simple, colloquial fashion here on this video. Number one, and he goes through all this in, in way more detail than I'm gonna go into. Number one, the thing has to be reliable. Doesn't matter if you're running an 1873 Winchester lever, lever action rifle, or if you're running, I don't know, uh, a deer hunting rifle can be used as a designated marksman rifle if you watch that movie Saving Private Ryan, right? Um, that's kind of the role that that guy was playing in the in this unit, right? He was operating on the squad level as the designated marksman. Not in a traditional sniper role where he's out there working for the battalion, you know, way up ahead, you know, like doing a lot of spot reports and stuff like that. But he was in the fight. He was the guy that aimed, okay? And so that's kind of, you can use bolt actions that have historically been used on the modern battle, battlefield. You're going to see a lot of stuff like the AR-10 platforms, very, very common, like the M110, the SR-25, and all the different variations that are coming out and have been out. There's a million different configurations, and a lot of guys will nerd out on that, and that's cool. I think it's fun. Which one is best? Those are really different configurations of the same basic platform. And in my opinion, the performance of each one of those rifles will vary based on the armor that kind of put it together, um, how the rifle was run, if it was damaged or not. Like there's a lot of details on the internal ballistics end of the spectrum in terms of the operation of the rifle. I'm not talking about the accuracy part which is like a 9,000 year discussion if you want to get into the weeds, which we love doing, by the way, at the RX-7 Arcade for accuracy. But in terms of the, the cycling of the weapon, the operation of the weapon, you need it to be very, very reliable. That's very important, okay? I'm gonna turn on my light here, it's getting dark out. And uh, so reliability is huge, okay? Uh, there are certain features that people will overlook because they don't see them as like, like a priority. For example, um, when I'm shopping for like a AR platform rifle, let's say I want to buy an M4. I'm going to look for stuff like if the castle nut, that sucker's got to be like double staked on there. And it's got to be staked on there well. The gas the gas key, likewise, you know, and you should look at the materials, it should be staked on there good. Likewise with the um, front sight post, I like to run the traditional A2 front sight post myself. Just because it's pinned on, and it ain't ever gonna just like wiggle off. And there's, you know, there's no parts that can unscrew up there and like render the, the whole weapon useless under firing. And you'd be surprised how often that happens. Not saying that there's a lot of high speed guys out there, a lot of serious operators that run equipment that do utilize features like that, but they have more continuous resupply, they have more continuous. Uh, access to an armor if their stuff was to break, right? They're not going on continuous missions for years on end, like uh, a guy would be on the civilian end of things. Like Most people who are going to be taking this class, by the way, our class is going to be very unique in that it's structured for like collapse of Western civilization on the civilian side if you're going to take this first class. But it's a direct crossover really for guys that are operating autonomously way out in the bush where they're not gonna have support, okay? Where they're kinda on their own. 
Uh, there's a lot of guys that work, you know, the State Department gigs and stuff like that. And they call for help and it might not show up, okay? And so for those kind of guys, they have to really maximize um, their, their focus on priorities. And particularly when you're talking about, the, you know, fighting equipment, the rifle has to be reliable, okay? Doesn't matter how many cool features it has, it has to be reliable. So it could be the most ugly shtick you ever saw, whichever configuration it is, whether it's an M110, SR25, you know, like a M M4 or whatever you're using, whatever you're utilizing even, okay? You, or an SVD or an FAL or a G3 or uh, there's a, a SCAR, you know, whatever, whatever weapon it is, each rifle is gonna have its own character and each rifle was put together by a human. So you have to kind of know what you're looking for when you're looking at it to make sure that the stuff is actually put together properly, okay? Reliability is huge. Number one priority, okay guys? Way over features. Features is at the bottom of the list in all reality, okay? Even barrel selection. Like an M4 with the 14 and a half inch barrel or, an, or a 16 inch barrel in the civilian world, totally adequate to really get the job done if placed in the right hands with the proper instruction and training and uh, knowledge of when to utilize it and how to utilize it, okay? A lot of guys don't think that it'll work fine, but you can smoke all kinds of bad guys with an M4, 600 meters, no problem, 700, 800, depending on the wind, okay? If you got the right reticle set up or if you know how to employ you know, BDC reticles properly or get them squared away at the parallel bore zero, things like that, okay? And we talk about all that stuff in the class. Likewise, so a part of having a reliable weapon is also a really good feature of any kind of fighting rifle. It should be rugged. And uh, our buddy Chase in his article explains that ruggedness is kind of a subcategory of reliability. Ruggedness means that, okay, so you might have a rifle that's uh, super reliable when everything's hunky-dory and when it's perfectly oiled and when there's no sand in it and when you didn't jump on it or you didn't put 6,000 rounds through it and all of a sudden something wiggled loose, right? Ruggedness means that it's going to stay reliable for a long time. It's not going to break on you. It's not going to fall apart. It's not going to wiggle loose. So that's ruggedness. So reliability and ruggedness are paramount, major priorities. Any rifle, you know, guys get so focused on configuration. Any rifle, I don't care how skinny the barrel it is or even how short it is, in the right hands on two-legged varmints, there's no excuse to not really dominate that, that battle space if you know what you're doing, okay? Um, so it's an emphasis on the marksmanship and it's an emphasis on the user. And also executing those skills in such a way in operation with other guys, which is part of the DMR uh, instru instru uh, program of instruction we have lined out, we do get into the small unit tactics part of it, okay? Once you do that, and you're operating with a couple guys that actually know what they're doing, you, you don't even need that many guys, just a couple that can work together, it's gonna be pretty good, okay? You're gonna come out on top in any of your Mad Max or Red Dawn scenarios if you're smart about it, uh, very reliably. I mean, it's always dangerous, obviously, right? But um, I think you catch my drift. So you got reliability and ruggedness, okay? A third uh, criteria, which is which is actually very important as well, as I mentioned it earlier, is going to be your logistical compatibility with other weapons in that area. If all the other guys are running stuff that's way different than yours, like a different cartridge, or like different magazines, or different weapons components, right? That could be a problem in a long-term operation, okay? Now, you'll see a lot of like special forces guys and you know a lot of the high speed units will be running very very proprietary equipment their table of equipment is loosened up quite a bit on the global war on terror because they have more continuous access to resupply okay they can get whatever parts fixed or whatever it is or if they don't like it they can change it so they operate all kinds of neat stuff out there because they're typically not going to be dropped off for like a period of five to ten years to win World War III, right? Like uh, when the original M24 program went through, that was the aim of that program was to get people situated with the with the rifle that would be 
basically you dropped the dude off in East Europe someplace when when the Russians would run through, like back in the old Cold War days, and like, okay, we'll see you when the war is over, if we win, and if you survive, and if you can find your way home. They just drop them off there, they give them open sites for the bolt action, and that's why they had a very simple, rugged configuration. Um, with the global war on terror, we basically dominate the supply lines. Uh, we can have stuff that runs on batteries now, and it's not that big of a deal because you can get a parachuted in or resupplied, you know, you can go back to the fob and get stuff. But for certain spots in the world and for certain scenarios, this is where our class is a little bit different. We're guessing and anticipating that the user is not going to have resupply for a long time. And this is like a class focused on that kind of a situation because that's the reality for a lot of guys who could really get the best use out of that skill set. Okay? Also, just the general preservation of ammunition just by utilizing a little more disciplined fire in certain scenarios because you can use designated marksmen, you know, as a, like fire suppression, right? Like if you got accurate fire, real accurate fire, even if they don't exactly hit the guy, but the bullet sings right past his ear it's gonna have the same effect that a machine gun would, okay? On the battlefield. You can read all the manuals if you want, okay guys? And so, it's highly effective way to save ammo and also, you know, for long-term operations. And so, when you're selecting your equipment, I like to pick something like in the, uh, in the United States. I think it's a really good choice is like an M, M16 platform type rifle, like an AR-15. M4, 20 inch, I don't care. Something that runs on a standard bolt carrier, you know, something that's uh, gonna run good on standard GI mags. Um, you know, all your major components are very, very common. So you can basically cannibalize other rifles to keep yours operational, okay? And whatever configuration you want is fine as long as you stay within that reliability and ruggedness parameters. You're not going to set up a fighting rifle that's that's really built for long-term combat like you would your your race gun. A race gun's a totally different animal. Just because it's like a quarter of a second faster, you that's a big trade-off. Sometimes you trade off a lot of reliability for that, okay? Because you have to have everything perfectly balanced out to be really efficient and smooth, but um, I mean, that's one of the reasons why like the military rifles have really ugly, nasty triggers on them. They're very reliable. Uh, that's why they have like what a lot of guys would call kind of an over gas configuration. They want enough gas to make sure that when that rifle is absolutely filthy, it will eject that round, right? And so if you have a, a, a gun that's raced out or adjusted with the gas block, where you're just barely ejecting that cartridge like you would have set up for a really slick competition rifle. When it gets dirty or after six years in the bush out there running around with Patrick Swayze and them guys, right? You're going to encounter failures, okay? So that's kind of what you got to think about is they were erroring on the side of reliability and ruggedness over smoothness of operation, okay? But logistical compatibility is a big deal. If you're in Asia or Africa, you might want to start looking at like FALs or whatever the local guys are using, Kalashnikov based stuff, SVDs, PSLs, whatever they're going to be use, a Mosin to gun. I mean, you got you can use whatever you want as long as you got the discipline part down, okay? And so that's my opinion on that. After that, knock yourself out with the configuration, pick whatever grip you know, you like or whatever tackle you want to put on there. Uh, you know, just select the furniture that's comfortable for you, that's a good fit. The configuration should be comfortable, you know, and should suit your your application. Don't get something too heavy because you're going to want to deploy it and be able to uh, move around with it. In, in, in a lot of cases, in the long term, extended combat or extended like collapse of civilization, like if there's an EMP or something, man, there ain't going to be no cars very quickly, right? And even if if you have like a 12 elf Cummins diesel, you're going to run out of fuel. 
and the pumps ain't going to pump because they're running on computers and electricity, right? So, and that's the reality in a lot of parts of the world. So this is not frivolous information for guys that actually operate and work in those types of environments right now, okay? Those places do exist. And so when you're talking about a designated marksman rifle, just to recap, reliability, ruggedness, logistical compatibility, and then worry about your configuration and all the comfortable features and, and your ninja tackle that you put on there, okay? All that stuff is added stuff. Now, the optic, I think, is an important choice um, for a designated marksman application. You get a lot out of a good optic. If you can find something pretty rugged, um, a good BDC reticle that's set up properly, I kind of prefer the ACSS reticles like a Trigicon TA31 ACSS Aurora is really, really good. And of course, it's been issued for a long time. If you don't got that kind of cash, uh, you can look at, the, I think Primary Arms has a variety of compact ACSS reticle scopes, like a three power and a five power. And I mean, name your poison, whichever one's going to work fine for you. Any of those are going to work fine is out to the max effective distance of those cartridges if you've got any kind of decent eyesight, okay? And they have a reticle in them. You, you're not dependent on batteries, and s those scopes are very tough, okay? And then there's all the other ones. They got the one to six, the one to eight platinums are incredible. Um, there's a lot of good scopes out there that I've reviewed over the years that have really held together surprisingly well. But you always do want to have backup uh, sights at any case, right? So you, you want to have your front sight post and you want to have a flip up rear sight or whatever you got for eventually, inevitably, uh, an optical instrument very, very likely could fail. So don't forget that deal. I think that's super important. So that's the equipment, okay? Um, good rifle that's reliable, good optic on there. This set up, by the way, for the cartridge you're using, right? And I would set it up for battle ammo like you're gonna find on the battlefield, right? Like guys ask, hey, like with a 308, should I, you know, would I use 175s or 168 match? You can, you can use that initially until you run out of ammo, but I would have something that will function fine with M80 ball, like the nasty stuff that you're gonna find, like machine gun ammo that you can scavenge off a belt or something, if that day comes. I mean, you want a NATO cartridge is a good idea, um, something that you can scavenge off the battlefield is going to be really, really helpful in terms of cartridge selection and stuff like that. Um, but really, it's going to be heavily placed on the marksman and the guy running the equipment. He's going to be like the big, giant determining factor of the effectiveness as a designated marksman. Okay, guys? So with that being said, uh, the way the course is set up, our DMR course starts off with the one-day whiskey course. It's not like a beginner's course. It's a refresher in some ways. Of course, we're going to go over standard terminology and stuff like that for the first like hour. But it's really a marksmanship course, a combat marksmanship course, learning the basics of different firing positions unsupported and learning how to operate your rifle as it was intended to be operated. Okay? Um, there's a lot of knots to untie with a lot of folks sometimes and that's why there's classes right and we're nice guys my, like my marksmanship instructors are like the nicest guys you'd ever meet in the world and they're very very good at what they do okay um and i i'm also there of course for any questions and to assist and to identify uh things and problems and stuff like that right uh but we're gonna get you squared away for shooting not only just prone a lot of guys get too used to shooting off a bipod in combat that might not be the option there's a bush or grass that's three feet high or you're in a tree or you're you're behind cover right and so you can't get that optimal you know prone position that would be ideal right a lot of times just due to wherever you're at or urban fighting you're going to be taking up non-conventional firing positions and so if you master like kneeling and sitting and standing sh shooting positions it's very easy to modify those with a little bit of additional non-conventional support and really dominate the universe all of a sudden okay so we're going to spend a lot of time on combat marksmanship on day one pretty much it's going to be a pretty high round count actually uh if depending on what kind of weapon you bring okay uh so a lot of guys ask about the round count you're probably going to have ammo left over 
but that's good because you want to go back home with ammo in your mags, right? You don't want to be driving home with no ammo left. What if that? What if Red Dawn happens on your way home? What are you gonna do then, smart guy? So we, I always like to overshoot on ammo. And there are a lot of guys that really want to get on there. This is one of those deals where actually a higher round count is really the only way to verify what's going on, okay? Now in the precision rifle world, it's a little bit different, but in this world, like, you're gonna be shooting a lot, okay? With your carbine and or with your battle rifle to kind of figure out these different positions. So that's day one. If you take uh, the second class, which is we have the whiskey class and we have the x-ray class, that's gonna show you how to actually uh, start introducing like multiple target engagement at various different ranges. And that's gonna be super helpful for when it actually happens. Um, you're gonna have to be able to know how to utilize whatever reticle you're using, whether it be a mill dot reticle or a ballistic drop compensating reticle or a horror style reticle or whatever you use in ACSS, right? Whatever reticle you are using, you need to have that be intuitive. So that's going to be a big part of it. And we're going to do drills on the x-ray class, which is the second class, on multiple target engagement from various positions. This ain't all just prone shooting, guys. It's going to be a little bit of a challenge. You always want to exercise the muscles that you're not comfortable with exercising. That's the ones you want to work on the most, right? I mean, that's how we, we, we're adding new skill sets, right, guys? And we're all nice people. It'll be fun. We're not going to yell at you and make fun of you or none of that stuff. That's, that's not our style. We teach you how to do all that stuff in a very sweet, loving way, right? Okay? Now, um, the third class, so we got W, X, Y, and Z, you know? You got the whiskey, the X-way, uh, the X-way, the X-way, Looney Tunes, right? You got the whiskey, the X-ray, and then we got the next one is going to be the small unit class, okay? And that's good, and that's the Yankee class. And I've been scouring the earth to try to find the best guy possible to teach this, okay? Um, of course, this is something that I could instruct, but it's a highly competitive field, and there's a lot of stuff to, and there's a lot of experience that I find to be highly valuable and like more valuable than gold uh, with certain people who have done this for a long time in real life and have actually mastered it, okay? So I found the perfect guy to teach the small unit tactics portion of the class. Of course, I will co-instruct and uh, we'll be going over various scenarios. We're gonna talk about how to operate in conjunction with other guys, okay? And I'm not going to get into too much detail. You can look at rexdefense.com if you want to know what we're going to be teaching during that class there. If you have any questions on if the guy is qualified to teach small unit tactics, you don't need to worry about it. He might be one of the most qualified guys in the world to do it. Um, back in the day when the shift over came from the, uh, the big war, went in the big war, in the Cold War, back in those days to the global war on terror, he was one of the guys that was tasked with going through all the manuals and readjusting all the doctrine to be more realistic, okay? Um, so we got ourselves a 180 Alpha, okay? If you know what that is, that's all you need to know. And uh, he's one of the guys that actually put a lot of this stuff together in the beginning. So don't have any reservations about wondering if you're gonna learn something, okay? Um, actually, you might unlearn a lot of things. There's a lot of baggage that sometimes people bring to the table. Um, there, there's a there's only like so much room in the attic that you can have, especially when you're under pressure. And simplifying the game and focusing on just those few priorities that are super important, that are often, you know, con conflated with all the other range dogmas and doctrines that you'll find in a lot of other outfits or different places and stuff like that can trip a guy up and sometimes you'll find that the higher up you go on the ladder like if you find yourself a, a like a real expert on some of this stuff when it comes to fighting okay like like a warrant officer green beret guy um they're gonna simplify it actually so they start to actually bring it back down to the to earth to, to where the rubber can meet the road and you can actually get your stuff squared away. So that's what we got set up for you guys for the SUT course, okay? And that's the Yankee class. The class after that is an invitation-only class. 
if you come to the other courses and you make it up through those and we look into your eyeballs and we determine that you're true blue, true red, white, and blue, okay? Then you might get invited to the Zulu course. And I, I'm not trying to be obnoxious. That's just something that a guy has to do out of responsibility. That's where we get really deep into, that's not a shooting course. All the other ones are shooting courses. This one is more of a, a planning course. How to get from point A to point B. How to plan it out. How to plan routes. How to do plan stops. You know, how to, how, like vehicle tactics. Like, not just your standard vehicle tactics, but like, what about if you got precious cargo? Like PSD, basically, right? So if you got your family with you and you're trying to get to grandma's house right when it hits the fan, this course, the Zulu course, is the one that's going to save your butt. What kills a lot of the guys on the battlefield are stupid things you would never think of unless you've been there long enough. So our instructor, um, our compadre, will be going through that and we'll be going, we'll be going over all different case studies. Um, you'll be allowed to bring your exact situation or a hypothetical situation of here's the point A to point B and then we'll discuss that and map it out and plan it out. How, how do you go about doing that, right? How do you even travel safely in, in, or as safely as possible? How, like, what do you do when you get to a bridge? Like when there's like, if it's a Mad Max situation and there's just like all kinds of horrible things going on all over the highways, right? You try to evade the highways, but if you get to a bottleneck, well, like, what do you do? You know, there's a lot of different schools of thought there. Most of them get to killed. So that's what the point of this course is, is for that kind of stuff. Um, so I'm excited, man. Um, this, it took a couple of years to put this thing together. I wanted to make damn sure that it was like the very best of its kind in the world. There are lots of other good designated marksman courses out there. This one is specifically tailored for a different application. This one is specifically tailored for like your cow sea situation, right? Collapse of Western civilization or for like a state department type deal, right? Like if you have absolutely no idea when the resupply or help is gonna come, how do you gotta set up your game then? Because it's gonna be different than like a police outfit or a straight up military outfit that's dependent on their friends, resupply, backup, airplanes, army tanks, the whole nine yards, having a whole, you know, battalion within radio distance of you. It might just be in in certain circumstances, just you and your your family or the dudes on your block, okay? Defending your little town, defending your ranch, whatever it is, or trying to get to grandma's house. And that's something that I think is highly important for people to understand. Uh, that this is a, a different class with a different point of aim and, um, and that's kind of what we got going on and so we found the best guys in the world to uh, co-instruct this class of course I'll be helping out with the, the marksmanship and getting the, the ballistics squared away making sure you're, you're, you're all tuned in with your weapon and then when it comes to the actual operational side of things nothing but the best for you baby we look forward to seeing you at the DMR class, if you guys can hop in. We can't have too many people at it because we have to like keep a high instructor to student ratio on these kind of classes. So if you want a ticket, rexdefense.com. You know, if you look under the designated marksman rifle classes or if you go on your little iPhone deal, it has uh, courses by date. It's coming up here next month, like September guys, okay? Uh, so it starts September 9th. And like I said before, I would love to continue to do these commercially in the future. Don't know if that'll happen. So if you can jump in, we'll love to see you. Pennsylvania. Rock and roll, guys. Rex out.